The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Thank you for this opportunity. I guess I'd also like to thank Committee 444 for putting this session on. This sort of aligns with some work that's going on within the committee. My title, again, is Performance Measurement of Avoided Slab System, and it's really a synergy of existing technologies, things we use for monitoring and testing an emerging technology, one specific technology in this case. Before I get into it, I'd like to just acknowledge the primary authors of this work. I get the joy of presenting this, but most of this work was actually done by Dr. Bernie Kasner, who is at VTRC. This was actually his load test, and we were fortunate enough to just piggyback on top of that. And then I had a number of researchers, Amir Gattasi, who has been instrumental in some of the testing, and then an undergraduate, Mark Hansen, who was instrumental in actually getting our new technology up and off the ground. I'm going to spend probably most of this talk talking kind of about the story, how we're going to use this technology. I haven't told you what the technology is yet, but it's ultimately digital image correlation and the potential application of this technology for structural health monitoring. And then what I'll spend the analysis part talking about is just a case study and a couple of select examples of load test results that we use our system on and then finish up with a little closure. So most of you are very aware of kind of the state of transportation infrastructure in the United States and you've probably seen report cards on the existing grades that we've been given. If we look at our overall grade, we're giving a D plus. I think most of you are probably not D plus students, so it's probably not a good thing to strive for. So we have opportunities for improvement. If we look at the bridges in particular, we have over 600,000 bridges in our national inventory, given an overall rating of about a C plus. So it's still not good. In Virginia, we have a rating of about C. So there's opportunities for improvement there. Some of the greatest challenges for this infrastructure, in particular bridges, is I would say the lack of resources and the lack of manpower to handle such a vast population of structures. So the concept of structural health monitoring really speaks directly to that. It serves as a promising temporal condition assessment strategy. And how people define structural health monitoring is typically pretty broad. But in my opinion, it's really a system performance evaluation strategy with an end goal of characterizing behavior, providing indications of damage, deterioration, and hopefully even forewarning for impending failure. And if you've read any of the structural health monitoring literature, there's a number of axioms that exist, but they ultimately boil down to detecting, localizing, quantifying location, and extent of damage and then also pushing it a little bit further is what do you do when you know what that damage is. In most cases for structural health monitoring applications have focused on temporal measurement so time series data monitoring over a long time so this work is actually a sort of a departure from that but it has the potential to extend for this temporal measurements as well. So most of these works have been vibration measurements or mechanical measurements. And what we're going to talk about here today is live load testing and diagnostic and proof testing, how they can be used for periodic assessment, which is also considered a structural health monitoring tool. So in our case, we provide measurements of a specific response, typically deflection, strains, rotations that can be beneficial to a structural health monitoring framework and ultimately provide direct inputs into what can be used for decision making. Okay, so when we look at existing infrastructure, which is one of our biggest challenges, there's a number of challenges associated with that. One is disruption of the operation is typically difficult and costly, right? We don't want to close down bridges to test them, but sometimes we do. And other challenges, things like structural behavior is somewhat complex, right? We make a lot of simplifications in design, but when we look at the actual behavior of these systems, there's a lot of inherent redundancy, redistribution of loads, load sharing. And then when we add in things like aging and deterioration, it becomes even more complex. We get unanticipated behaviors and it's typically a departure or a divergence from the design expectation. And then when we look at what we typically do with structural health monitoring, we're often trying to in place sensors on the structure and monitor those sensors over time. So that can be costly depending on how many sensors are being put in place, how long the sensors last. Specifically to this particular presentation, we often will be interested in things like deflection measurements, right? It gives us an indication of response of the system. Is it behaving as we expect? When we look at mechanical measurements of deflection, 
one of the challenges with measuring deflection is we often need some sort of fixed reference to correlate with. And I think our next presentation also speaks to this topic, but mine is actually looking at digital image correlation, so I'm not 100% sure how versed the audience is, so I'll give you a quick background on digital image correlation, or DIC. It's ultimately a non-contact photogrammetric technique, and what its primary goal is for uh, measuring full field deformation behavior, and it could be done in either 2D or 3D configuration. The 2D typically will require one camera. The 3D requires two cameras, at least. And for reference, if you think if you've been to a 3D movie anytime recently, it's kind of the same principles where you're able to capture out of plane movement by the stereo pairs of imagery and, and correlating how the cameras are with res- our reference with respect to each other. There's some literature that describes the resolution of the IC. I, I just came back from the inaugural conference on digital image correlation, and there's been a lot of discussion on what the resolution is. It's been touted to have a field view or resolutions on the order of one one hundred thousandth of the field of view. So obviously, depending on how far you are, what type of camera you're using, but you're able to resolve very, very fine strains depending on your imaging setup. And if you look at, for the 3D system, 1 50,000th of the field of view, okay? The basic process for DIC, and the the schematic sort of shows this, but we basically take a series of sequential images, and you could do it at different stages, and we measure the deformation by tracking or correlating the pixels from image to image. So we want to find the same pixels in one image relative to the next image, and then from that, you can divide the image up and find the deformations that occur within subsets. So it's very similar in concept to what's done with the finite element method, where we interpolate between these subsets to come up with a deformation field. So the application of digital image correlation to structural health monitoring, people have asked me this, they say, well, how would you really use this? The goal is applying it in a manner that we can capture a richer data set. As I said, it's full field measurement, which is dramatically different than a localized sensor. You know, we'll take a strain gauge, for example. But strain gauge in one location, you can measure strain at that location, assuming that it's over that gauge length. The IC is slightly different than that, as we're able to measure deformations over the entire specimen that we're imaging. So we can't do typically things internally, but anything on the surface we can see. That's sort of a neat tool, and it sort of crosses the boundaries when we look at typical global measurements. So if we look at vibration measurements, which is pretty typical for structural health monitoring applications, we get global measures, but not typically local measures. We can actually use DIC to do both, right? We can do deformations for a local spot. We can also look at the entire system as a whole. That's sort of the underlying goal of how we would like to use it. And then this would be an adaptation of using it, which is typically done in a laboratory setting. So we're sort of pushing the boundaries of how this technique has been used. So we're trying to apply it out in the field to help us make more informed decisions. And so visually, and I apologize for this, but I'll point it out. This is kind of visually what we're talking about here. Able to measure deformations, full field deformations of a structure in service without ultimately disrupting traffic. Typically what we would need to do is pattern the structure in some manner to create that contrast that creates a unique pattern and we'll follow that and track that pattern. The apology is for, this is just sort of a a cartoon representation. Obviously the the strain fields don't really align, but I asked one of my students to do this and this is what he came up with. So I apologize. The case study we're gonna talk about here is the Atkins Road Bridge. And I'll say this, I'm not gonna get into too much of the details of the structure itself, because really the point of this is to kind of show how the technology works. But the Atkins Road Bridge is a five-span bridge that carries Route 618 over the Chickahominy River. It's located basically at the intersection of Charles City and Kent County Lines. And it's a span of 207 feet with a span length of about 41 foot per span. Transverse width of about 24 feet and a 7 degree horizontal curve with 5.5 degree super elevation. It's obviously not shown in the schematic here. This structure has nine voided pre-stressed slab beams that are ultimately the equivalent of a box beam type structure. And you can see the numbering system going across the bottom here, girder 9 through 1. This is actually the work from uh, Dr. Kasner, so I'm sort of following his nomenclature. And unfortunately, as Trey pointed out, he's in a nice location. This is sort of like a swampy area. This is what the bridge actually looked like. And I would point out the one key feature that you could probably observe from this bridge is obviously it crosses water, right? That's the one thing. And when I spoke earlier, I mentioned that one of the challenges with deflection measurements is typically the fixed frame of reference that you need for deflection measurements. So most of the time when we do these load tests, we'll have some sort of LVDT or what we call our twangers, which I'll talk about here in a second. We'll anchor them in the river or hopefully on the ground, preferably, but anchor them. And then we correlate deflection with changes in resistance in the actual instrument itself. But that's it's challenging if you have moving waters, if you have deep water, there's probably a certain degree of uncertainty associated with those types of measurements. So DIC and how we're using it here sort of provides a neat alternative 
to that application. So some basics on pre-stressed box or avoided slab sections, rapid construction, cost savings in terms of form work, but the mechanisms for transferring the shear often fails, right? So if you have these structures where you have uncertainty and chemical laden salt waters getting in between, you can get deterioration of the post tensioning between those. You also don't typically know what's happening internal to the structure, so those can be somewhat challenging. So the condition state of this particular bridge is sort of the story still. Fully corroded pre-stressing strands were noted, the laminations were noted and on the beam soffit, and then scaling on the underside was noted back in 2011. And then in 2013, the inspectors were out on site and heard a loud noise and was possibly due to wire breakage in the pre-stressing strand. It was uncertain. So the bridge was immediately closed until the superstructure could be replaced, and that sort of is what prompted the proof testing of this structure. And our objectives here was to proof load test the structure using a series of increasing loads. If you've ever done a proof test, you kind of want to figure out how far you can take it. And that was the end goal. And understanding really what the reasons were for the deterioration of the voided slab system. And then also analyze the residual load carrying capacity of this type of system. So that's the overall project goals. We sort of added on our own little piece in here. We wanted to see if we could deploy this DIC technique in the field. From my own experience, I've tried this three times, and this is the first, well, it's not the first. We've had other successes, but we've had mixed successes in deploying this technique, and I'll talk about those here in a second. But we wanted to see if we can use it as a technique to supplement our existing load tests. Again, the river was one of our challenges. We had a series of loading configurations. There was a total of six load cases. I'm only going to just talk about three, and I sort of picked them at random. But in our test here, we had six load cases moving the truck across the bridge, and we had a series of physical instrumentation, which we'll call, our, in our case, these twangers which are cantilever tip deflection sensors. So you basically glue them to the bottom of the structure, pre-tension the cantilever tip. It's already pre-calibrated, but you correlate the deflection with the change in strain in the boil gauge at the support of the cantilever tip. So we had these at different locations, and one of the challenges we had was ultimately the limited number of sensors we had available to us to test. Ideally, if you wanted to know things like how the load is distributed, we probably want to instrument the whole structure, but we had a limited number we could use. So the twangers were placed on girders one through five, and then on girder nine, there was a different type of instrumentation used. It was basically a tensiometer or a string pot, and and then we actually ultimately put our deflection targets for the DIC at these locations. I'll show you the other two load cases. Ultimately, the different configurations were intended to load different girders. So we did an exterior, sort of an interior, and then sort of a middle configuration. And if we look at the data set, I'll just point out a couple things here with the DIC. Typically, when you're dealing with a 3D DIC, you need to calibrate your images so you have a frame of reference, you have scale applied. So we had to apply targets, or we had these little cards that we had up on there. We calibrated the cameras. And then what we were doing for this particular technique was just deflection measurements. So we were just tracking the movement of these cards. That was simply the process. In a 2D configuration, you wouldn't use the calibration, but you would have to apply something like a scale to the target and track that motion. In our case, we set up our cameras in the swampy area, and we were looking at this location. We had some other cameras looking at the other side, and this was sort of the ideal setup, but one of the challenges with this DIC setup was that it took so long to get the test done that the light came and was flashing off the water, reflecting, washing out some of our images. So some of the cases that I presented here are just examples, okay? So this is just our typical time series data that we're we're able to see, we're able to see almost an identical type of behavior out of our DIC measurement. Now, these aren't necessarily apples apples. The one that we can compare here is a string pot potentiometer, which in the case that I was just talking about, the fixed frame of reference, the string pot didn't work. Okay, so the string pot actually, I'm not sure if it was broken or it just failed, but we're able to see the deformations on the order of hundredths of an inch with respect to our DIC technique. And then our other two cases, I'll just kind of move through these quickly here. You see similar results. We're on the order of five hundredths of an inch. We're on the order of four hundredths of an inch for a similar type of measurement. And last case, I'm not going to go through this one, but you can kind of see the same idea. Ultimately, the technique works. There's some issues with respect to lighting setup that can be challenging, but it was implemented in parallel. It provided a non-contact measurement. When you deal with the calibration, that can be somewhat challenging. But one thing I will point out is you could do the calibration off-site and tilt your cameras around, so we didn't necessarily have to use the cards. So ultimately, all we would need is something to compare against the tracked card, glue it to the bottom, and we can go forward. So again, our results were in good agreement for the cases we had. We had some locations where we couldn't correlate because we had poor data from our mechanical measurements. With that, I'll conclude.